In this roundup of the week, we begin to reap what we sowed over the last month as trust in institutions goes through the floor and people begin to kick back against the narrative that everything's awful and everyone's racist. My name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. Welcome back to the slightly disgusting bowl of goldfish soup that is 2020. I trust you're well and dodging the virus. Actions have consequences. I mean, we all knew that, but it seems that us old human beings, us goofy, lovable human beings, will insist on acting as though we'd never heard of a concept. We might as well get used to this because in the absence of further exciting actions, and we shouldn't count those out, the theme for the rest of the year is going to be consequences. And this week it's predominantly about consistency and fairness and the consequences of achieving neither. This week, a number of US states have been seeing a worrying uptick in coronavirus cases. Many states are going ahead regardless with relaxing lockdown, probably because they feel their populations won't put up with a reimposition of stay at home policies. Austin, Texas is one of those that is extending its lockdown in the face of a surge of new cases, although the rest of Texas is going ahead with opening up. In Arizona, there's a similar spike. Medical experts have speculated that this has come about because of the lifting of lockdown, which they said has been carried out too quickly. There's something of a question mark over that explanation, because by relaxing stay-at-home policies, states were really doing what many European countries have already done. Generally speaking, the European relaxation of lockdown measures did not see an uptake in Covid cases. In fact, surprisingly so. Now, maybe that was because they've gone more gradually, one step at a time, and perhaps the way it's been done in the US has been different. Perhaps the majority of EU countries had more of a downward curve of infections taking place than did some of the US states before they relaxed. Those may definitely be a factor. It may be a factor how badly hit an area has already been. There is no uptick in New York, for instance. But upticks in states that weren't so badly hit previously. But it's notable that generally the majority of the press are not even mentioning in a speculative way whether there might have been any other events that might have exacerbated the return of virus growth rates. Here's some non-social distancing taking place in Austin, Texas. This specific photo was taken on the seventh day running for such protests. Here's more from Jacksonville. Protests there have been going on for several weeks. On June the 1st, Jacksonville Mayor Lenny Curry acknowledged that the protests might lead to an increase in the virus. He said the city would see in about 7 to 14 days if there's been a spike in cases. By June the 13th, cases had indeed spiked, up 37% in two weeks. News reports said the surge of cases so far this month coincides both with the reopening of Florida's economy following the statewide safer at home lockdown and an increase in the state's testing capacity. No mention at all of the protests, nor of Mayor Curry's timeline. And this isn't some silly partisan point scoring issue. According to the Covid tracking project, more than 21,000 African Americans have died from the virus nationwide, nearly two times the rate of the rest of the population. So events that specifically target that demographic are kind of important to keep an eye on, you would think. And people are going to wonder because we've seen inconsistencies. When largely Trump-supporting protests against stay-at-home policies took place, people were clear this was a virus-spreading danger. When much larger, closely packed and, shall we say, boisterous protests took place over the death of George Floyd, there was a huge degree of support and tolerance from politicians, the media and others. You even had, as mentioned a couple of weeks ago, an open letter by a thousand medical professionals saying that it was all justified because of the importance of the issue of systemic racism. What few articles there have been have tended to be downplaying any impact, whilst arguing that it's all justified by the issue anyway. So it's a valid question as to whether the judgment of professionals is likely to be trusted, particularly by conservatives, as they've apparently pitched their tent on one side of a debate, and that is seen to give them a conflict of interest, surely, when it comes to impartiality. If you're an epidemiologist and you've publicly supported the protests, you're probably not then going to want to speculate about the contribution those protests may have made to an increase in people dying of disease. 
Trevor Bedford, a researcher at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Centre, tweeted his rough estimate on the impact of the protests. He said he expects the protests to increase the number of infections in the US by between 3 and 6% per day, which over time could lead to hundreds of additional deaths each day, which you'd think would be a concern. You know, if you believe that those lives mattered. If only there was some way to get that message over. But Bill de Blasio is on the case. Apparently, New York's contact tracers have been told not to ask infected people if they've attended BLM protests. A former city staffer said they don't want to know the answer. If the results come back and suggest the protests have exacerbated the situation when you've given them a social distancing pass, then how does that make the mayor look? I don't know. Like someone whose partisan outlook makes him an untrustworthy voice for you to trust your health and well-being to? Maybe. I'm just guessing. On the plus side, the impact is likely to be modest. Being part of a group outdoors is by all evidence less high risk than indoors. But that's kind of the point. The key question is one of consistency and fairness. People are asking how come it's safe for these protesters to gather, ignoring social distancing and often not wearing masks, but their kids can't play baseball. And the mayor threatened a robust response to people gathering outside bars in New York. And how come protesting one thing is a dreadful thing to do, while protesting another thing in exactly the same conditions is just peachy? And you can come up with whatever excuses you like for that. Articles say things like racism is a public health issue. But the point is it looks inconsistent for political purposes. And that undermines the trust the medical community might actually need if there is a second wave. So what? President Trump's having the first of his rallies this weekend? How awful. But, but there's a pandemic. Too bad. You already blew that one right out of the water. But it's undercover, indoors. The protests were outdoors. And I agree. I think that's a dumb move, personally. But those fine distinctions were lost when you said groups of 10 people shouldn't gather and then conveniently changed to say it was OK if thousands gathered. You didn't hold that line. So now you want to draw a new line? Why ever might they not be taking you totally seriously on that? Maybe they think people's health will benefit by Trump's re-election. So for them, it's a public health issue as well. That's the thing about loopholes. You can go both ways through them. So there you go. Actions have consequences. We were also seeing consequences in London last weekend when a group of apparently furious patriots or football hooligans and or far-right activists came to London spoiling for a fight with the people who might want to pull down statues of people like Churchill. I'm not quite sure I've fathomed the mentality of people like this, at least not the proportion of them that seem pretty keen to pick a fight with police. You'd think that if you were supporting the great British institutions of the likes of Churchill against law-breaking protesters, you'd be on the side of the police. Uh, that's what comes of naively thinking things are about what people say they're about. By and large, the evidence was that such subtlety would be wasted on many of the protagonists. In any case, the police, who were criticised the week before for being too passive, standing back while vandalism was done, running away from protesters when they weren't bending the knee in deference to them, well, they came with a rather different approach this time. Riot gear, clear determination to face down the expected confrontations, which was probably the right thing to do. But again, even though there may be a good answer to the question, why did you do that this week and not last week? Even non-malicious partisans end up drawing conclusions based on how it looks. Now, there was actually some insight on this in an interview that took place this week with one of the SAGE experts, Professor Clifford Stott, a psychologist specialising in crowd control, who talked about lessons that have been learned in studies he carried out in the policing of football crowds. His research sparked a new approach to policing, where police realised that they would be seen as more legitimate if they were friendlier with the crowd members who were not causing trouble, while keeping the capacity on hand to respond to any serious incidents. The aim was to get the moderate members of the crowd to see themselves as allies with the police against the troublemakers, rather than being pulled into a confrontation where it was the entire crowd versus the police. If successful, the police move from being an out-group to being an in-group because of how they approach policing the event. It's an interesting example of how techniques are often used deliberately to influence how people behave. We'll come back to that later. 
You could see some of those techniques at work in the way they approached policing the Black Lives Matter protests. And in some ways, this highlighted some of the differences between the police forces in the UK, where there's a tradition of policing by consent, and in the US. Whether the statistics show endemic racism in the US police or not, and we talked a couple of weeks ago about the figures that suggested not, there's no doubt that the US police uses lethal force much more routinely. An article this week on the Quillette website by John McWhirter made the point. In 2015, Officer Michael Slager shot Walter Scott Black in the back and killed him as he was running to evade a traffic ticket. The following year, Andrew Thomas White was shot in the neck by a police officer and killed as he climbed out of the SUV he'd crashed trying to evade arrest. In 2015, Sam Dubose Black was shot dead as he tried to escape a traffic summons in his car. The same year, Michael Parker, white, was shot dead in the same way while trying to escape a ticket for a moving violation. And so on. He gives a number of other examples of black and white people being shot by police in very similar circumstances to each other. He's making the point that the argument that black people are shot in circumstances where white people would just be given a caution is not supported by the facts. There is clearly a problem. Which seems to be that all too often we're seeing incidents of lethal force being used when it shouldn't be. If you misdiagnose that problem as one of endemic racism, then your solutions are going to be all about how to tackle racism, not how do you better train the police to respond more effectively in a range of high-pressure situations. And particularly if you define racism in this sort of original sin way that people are prone to, where whatever you do, you're still going to be guilty, then that's how you end up with a situation that you've ended up to now, where there is literally no practical answer. And so people start calling for the whole institution to be abolished, defunding the police, and not only defunding it because there's some more effective alternative, but defunding it as a result of demonising it and the people within it. And that's a process which can also have consequences, because then you have the police themselves looking at this in relation to their job to keep communities safe, often putting themselves in danger while doing so, and then they ask, is this consistent, is this fair? In Atlanta, police were involved in another fatal shooting this week, where they shot and killed Rayshard Brooks. The Brooks incident wasn't so clear-cut as what happened with George Floyd. He failed a sobriety test, he grabbed a taser from an officer and was trying to use it against him as he was running away, which is when he was shot. So with any of these incidents, there are circumstances. What you would expect is that the authorities will look carefully at those circumstances before coming to a conclusion. Well, maybe that was how we did things last month, but not anymore. The district attorney, Paul Howard, announced at a press conference that the officer who shot Brooks was to be charged with felony murder and 10 other crimes. This announcement was news to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, who said, Although we've made significant progress in the case, we have not completed our work. Our goal in every officer-involved shooting case we are requested to review is to complete a thorough impartial investigation before we submit the file to the respective district attorney's office. So due process, I'm sure that used to be a thing. So guess what? When you demonise the police, defund the police, assume guilt without due process, even ban the TV shows that show the police in a good light, because you're not allowed to show the police in a good light anymore... Guess what happens then? Well, unhappy police happens. Atlanta police let their feelings be known by walking out, except they can't walk out, so significant numbers of them called in sick. The so-called blue flu. And Atlanta struggled to get cover from neighbouring precincts because nobody there wanted to do it either. Here's the thing, it turns out morale in police departments across the country is rock bottom. It seems that if you send people into life or death situations and you make it clear you will not support them, you will charge them for murder first and ask questions later, and maybe you'll even abolish them because they're all just bad people, you get a morale problem. Quick, someone rewrite the HR manuals because that's surely new information right there. None of this is probably assisted by stories such as the NYPD officers intentionally poisoned with bleach by a Shake Shack employee. Except, of course, that wasn't true. Nothing of a sort happened. Still managed to make headlines, though. And those headlines set the tone, even when they turn out to be fake news. Where we have ended up is that we have a crisis of faith in institutions. The police are just the latest part of it. 
We have governments on the back foot because they've been generally exposed as being pretty incompetent in the face of a real and immediate challenge. In the UK, we just saw the latest iteration of this with the announcement that the UK's test and tracing app, which it decided to do independently, scorning the official model set up by Apple and Google, has been a complete failure. As long ago as May the 1st, I was talking on this channel about the fact that Apple and Google had created a decentralized framework for COVID-19 track and trace apps that protected the privacy of individual users, even from their own governments. And noted that countries like France, who scorned these restrictions, were demanding that the tech companies allow them to centrally gather user data without any signs the companies were going to cave in and allow that to happen. And that the UK seemed intending to go the same route. Well, they did. And the companies held the line. And the UK's app has failed. The point of failure is how Bluetooth is used in the background, or rather not. On Apple iPhones, apps are not allowed to use Bluetooth in the background when the app is not open. Apple defends users' privacy very vigorously. So the UK's app, which depends on Bluetooth working in the background all the time, doesn't work on iPhones. So if I was pointing that out here on the 1st of May, and I was only doing that because everyone in the industry was pointing it out around the same time, how does the UK end up deciding to plough ahead regardless, only months later to realise the app doesn't work because of that thing that everybody said wouldn't work? Although by all accounts, it's not just that they grabbed and ran with the wrong concept, but also because they executed it badly. According to Gizmodo, trials in the Isle of Wight saw reports of residents being told they'd come into contact with an infected person while they were asleep in their beds at home. And it was also a huge drain on batteries and all sorts of other problems. It was a buggy mess. But it doesn't matter. Because although we were told before that having an app to help track and trace was completely essential to making this work, we all needed to download this app so we could come out of a lockdown without fear well, now we're told that it's OK. We're going to track and trace just fine anyway without an app. And it's in that where the crisis of confidence kicks in. Not because of a revelation that governments are rubbish at designing functional technology that we knew already, but because of the things they've been telling us, not in order to give us true information, but in order to make us do the right thing. She told me. She I told you exactly what you needed to hear. That's all. There's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. When the UK government first locked us down, they gave us a simple slogan. Stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Every press conference, every official communication, that is what they would repeat. Why? Because the communications experts, remember I mentioned earlier, Professor Clifford Stott, the crowd control expert, a member of the UK's SAGE committee, the communications experts know that a certain type of simple communication repeated over and over and over is the most simple way to influence a wider body of people. They weren't expecting 100% compliance with lockdown, but they were using the communication techniques known to be most effective at achieving the best rate of compliance. And we took it because we got it. We understood that this was the message that the experts had agreed was the correct one for the situation that we were in. At least we mostly took it. They also said don't panic buy and a significant number ignored them on that. They panicked, they bought, they emptied the shop so that those who did as they were told suddenly found that certain shelves were empty. And there's your problem right there. If we're scared we lurch towards whatever seems best for us. We break ranks and get selfish. So the governments and the experts that advise them have not only been thinking through what should be done, but how to influence the public on what they need them to do. And that raises quite pointy questions about the safety of the individual versus the good of the whole. So take the question of face masks. In the US, as well as in the UK, the public was told not to worry themselves about face masks. They don't really make that much difference. And people said, but, but, but they, they use them in Asia when there's a virus. We say, yeah, but that's just what people do there. It doesn't really make much difference. And people said, but, but, but they use them in hospitals. And they said, yeah, but what they use is professional grade equipment. And they're in a different environment. And besides, it's a Thursday or something. 
Anyway, of course, now they're telling us that we should all be wearing face masks. You can't get on public transport in the UK now unless you're wearing some sort of covering on your face. What changed? The thing that changed is that they managed to get hold of enough masks for the health services. They're no longer in competition. It was never that masks made no difference. If you researched it at the time, it was always clear that it made some difference. Not a lot of difference, but some difference. Unless you were wearing a professional grade mask, in which case it made more difference. And that was what they didn't want you to do because they needed the professional grade masks for the key workers. Now, how do you work this out? Do you get all upset because the government did a thing that wasn't optimised around your personal short-term well-being and best interests? Or do you accept that for the good of the whole, the health workers needed to get priority? They needed to get the equipment and therefore you needed to stay at home. Because those same people who did all that panic buying, which wasn't you, obviously, although what a lot of toilet roll you seem to have. But anyway, those people, the other people, they would selfishly get whatever they could without caring about who needed it more. Even if it might be them in the ICU with their lives in the hands of the professionals, they weren't thinking that far ahead. The answer to that question is probably different depending on how much trust you have for the government and how much respect you have for their competence. Because you might be willing to make that trade-off if it's meaningful and effective, but if you think the country's being led by idiots, you probably don't want to sacrifice yourself at the altar of their stupidity. And therein lies the problem. Even in the best scenario, governments go into this extended crisis with goodwill, knowing that as things unfold, goodwill will gradually get chipped away. And that will happen even if they do a good job. That goodwill goes a lot quicker if the authorities end up doing things that don't make any sense. And you're suddenly left thinking that things aren't consistent and they aren't fair. So as I said before, the experts say it's good to gather together to protest, but letting your kids play with each other outside is bad. You're told that you must do today what you were told you must not do yesterday. The UK didn't stop people coming into the country at the start, when arguably it might have made a difference, but they've imposed a 14-day quarantine now. Doesn't make any sense, unless they simply don't want you going on foreign holidays right now because they know that you will as soon as you can, and they're terrified of a second wave. So OK, they know they might not be able to hold that line, so now they're talking about travel corridors to trusted countries. Well, why those countries? I mean, the countries they mention are no better than a bunch of others when it comes to the virus. So maybe it's about keeping a lid on the amount of holiday travel overall, so it doesn't get out of hand. Eventually you realise the government isn't communicating with you, it's attempting to manage your behaviour. And you might as well recognise that and be happy to go along with it, but ultimately it comes down to that trust. And some people lose a bit of that trust every time they feel the government is lying to them. Polls at the end of last month showed that UK public trust in the government to provide accurate information about the pandemic went down by 19 points since mid-April and to a lesser extent also for scientists and experts. So right now trust in the police is damaged, trust in government and their scientific experts is down and there's a lot of frustrated people who have been personally damaged, thrown out of a job, had loved ones taken away from them and been cooped up just doesn't feel like we're going to get any boring weeks anytime soon as that lot continues to play itself out. Meanwhile, the culture war continues in full swing in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement. In the UK today, there's a debate going on about whether the fan song Swing Low Sweet Chariot should be banned after the rugby football union said it was going to review its use because of connections to slavery. In response, Trevor Phillips, the veteran equality campaigner, pointed out that the song was written after the Civil War by a freed slave. It was made popular by African-American singers, sung at civil rights demonstrations, and was a favourite of Martin Luther King's, amongst others. The last country that attempted to ban it was Germany in 1939. But that's where we are, it seems. Meanwhile, one Twitter user noticed this declaration on Sky TV's listing of the live-action version of Aladdin, starring Will Smith. This film has outdated attitudes, language and cultural depictions which may cause offence today. Well, yeah. I mean, the film was from 2019, after all. We were all such vicious racists in those days. I remember it well. 
Speaking of significant overreactions, I have to stand apart from most of my peers in respecting sympathy for this poor guy here. He came down to join the protests against the statue toppling. I have no idea if he's a good or a bad person, but this photo showed him relieving himself next to a plaque in memorial to the policeman Keith Palmer, who was killed in a terrorist attack on Parliament just a couple of years ago. Someone took the photo, circulated it on social media, where it caused outrage. And yes, if someone had specifically said, what, a dead copper? I'll show what we think of the coppers, and had done that deliberately, that would be bad. That would be worthy of outrage. But you look at that picture, and this is clearly someone who was caught short, just decided to pee against the wall. I speculated at the time he probably didn't even notice or think about the plaque, which was then confirmed afterwards. And do you know why he did that? Because they've closed all the public toilets because of COVID-19. You close the public toilets, guess what happens? I saw this somewhere else recently, a park that had stuck up a huffy sign telling people they shouldn't use the park as a toilet. And they put it up right next to the public toilets, which were closed. I mean, seriously, this is what gets people mad at the public authorities when they do dumb stuff. Whatever you think people are going to do, what else can they do? Anyway, for peeing in public, that man was sent to jail for 14 days, which seems to me to be a ridiculous overreach, as does the announcement of a 10-year jail term for desecrating war memorials, which has been announced. I mean, I oppose people pulling down statues and the like, but 10 years in jail? Really? How did we get that authoritarian so quickly? And speaking of authoritarians... News came today that multiple ministries in China have started telling the provinces there to slam the brakes on any new coal-fired power stations. Apparently the move effectively kills most new coal power plants proposed by local government in 2020. Given the huge question mark there's been over China as the world grapples with the issue of climate change, that counts as a first crack in the edifice of Chinese commitment to coal that we've seen. Anyway, we can only wait with bated breath to see what's on the way for next week. Thanks again to the people who signed up to support this channel on Patreon. Last week's video was demonetized again, but this time it was restored after a manual review was carried out after a couple of days. Of course, it's the first couple of days when the videos get the majority of their views, which is kind of annoying, but there you go. Having generous supporters and patrons means that I can continue to talk about the interesting issues regardless of whether YouTube allows adverts against them or not. So, if you want to support the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that this channel aims to provide, please consider adding your support to that of the wonderful people that have done so already. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.